Hello everyone and welcome back to Oh My God I Forgot the Radiators, also known as my Mars Colonization Series in Kerbal Space Program 1.6.1. So in the previous video I sent an ISRU unit to the moon and uh, it didn't drill very much and yes I guess I forgot to put radiators and that's partly because I've been playing Aro so long and never got to the part where I was using the ISRU units at all. Probably about three, four years ago, I might remember because I was playing stock more often. But yeah, so this time I have, first of all, reduced the size of that electrolysis unit. Remember, it was going really fast. Oh my god, these things are poking out. These are very active radiators. Okay, uh, can I stop it from auto? Ex uh, yes, automated off would be good. And how about the other side? So yeah, I've got two stock radiators and I've also got some of the case beam or stellar radiators just to see how they work. Looks like the symmetry works as far as retraction is concerned. Okay, so yeah, we'll see how they work. Uh, the stock ones are pretty heavy. Uh, I scaled them down with tweak scale. I haven't seen any problem with tweak scale yet. I haven't read, somebody mentioned that there might be an issue, but I haven't read anything. It seems to be correctly doing the mass and uh, we've got basically 0.5 tons worth as far as the stock radiators and then I added some of the fancy KSP interstellar radiators, these guys. I'm going to turn off everything as far as the radiator cooling and we'll try them in turn and see how OP those KSP interstellar ones are. Now the stock ones have been modified by KSP interstellar as well. So anyway, uh, if you commented on the uh, previous video, hey, you forgot the radiators. Obviously, I'm not going to go and respond to each one in turn. This is my answer to you. Yes, uh, we are going to fix that. Now, I'm not going to belabor this. I'll probably uh, speed through the whole launch thing. And uh, if I need to adjust the satellites around the moon, I'll just do that off camera. So here we go. So hopefully I will get us to the moon in record time and we'll try and land as close to the other unit as possible because I want a good comparison, right? I want to see exactly how much better the radiators make things. So we're going to try a pinpoint landing. It seems like we keep destroying our structure <laughs> after we launch. I thought I had put enough heat tolerance on it that we wouldn't do that, but to show what's going on there. Anyway, maybe, I, maybe it's actually toppling. Hmm. I'll have to think about that. Anyway, so, yep. We will try this again. Hopefully we'll get to add some modules to our Mars mission in orbit around the Earth. I think we will. So, I hear that Rocket Lab is planning to catch their first stage with a helicopter and a, and a parafoil. That was an idea from the 1960s, of course. Uh, some people thought about doing it with the Saturn 1 first stage, but obviously that would be too big and require a special helicopter. Uh, the problem has been that either first stages have been too big, like the Saturn 1 first stage, or they have been so small and simple it isn't worthwhile. Uh, the difference with Electron and why it's worthwhile is it's got nine engines at the bottom. So it's actually a pretty complicated stage, even though it's very small. So the fact that it's small makes it easier to handle with a helicopter, um, and its complexity means that it's worthwhile. Normally, uh, stages that small would only have one engine, and probably a pretty simple one like uh, a solid rocket motor, in fact or like the Vanguard, but that's not a very good comparison. But anyway, you get the picture. So it's a, it's a good idea. And even in the 1960s, they were catching Corona capsules with the helicopters. The CIA would uh, take use a satellite to take photos and then eject the capsule and then have the capsule parachute down and then catch it with a helicopter. So it's, it's a generally feasible thing. It hasn't been done with a full rocket stage of the same size as Electron, but it has been hypothesized before. Certainly more often than landing on a barge has, so, you know, this promise. Makes me sort, and the reason I bring it up is because it sort of makes me think about uh, 
doing some reusability stuff with this, but I, I think that should be like the second iteration after we do our first test of the whole Mars business. Okay, getting ready for boosted separation. And off they go. And fairing separation. So I uh, put the electrolyzer on top because now it's smaller than the canister for the hydrates. So it's just that tiny little thing now. I mean, it was going so fast and taking up so much power last time. I didn't think we needed a bigger one than this. This is the smallest size, I think. And you can see these are the fancy graphite radiators that come with KSP Interstellar. And again, we won't immediately try them out. These are the retractable radiators. They look tiny, but take a look at the mass, 0.277 tons. And considering the mass of this whole thing, that's a pretty substantial amount. That's, uh, well, more than 5%, uh, what is it, maybe 6% or so of the mass of the entire stage. So, not minor. Oh, and I fixed the sort of... We, we had a duplicate um, life support thing with jigs uh, in one part. I've, I've removed that. That was just my fault. Somebody made a comment on that. No, uh, it, was, it was just my own configuration fault. Um, I had uh, added those modules in on the part itself and then also in the RO configuration for that part. That was my part that I was configuring, so. So that's why I had duplicate modules. That was one of the station modules. I still have the full 100 MLI layers on both the this uh, Blue Moon Lander and the Sajita upper stage. I decided that this was not the time to allow boy law all over the place, <laughs> so I might reduce that. The problem was when I was reducing the MLI layers, peculiarly, um, it wasn't reducing the mass, uh, it wasn't increasing the delta V of the vehicle, so I don't know whether it was just reading the delta V wrong or something else. So I'll check on that. I still do have to check on what the heck is up with uh, tweak scale if there really is an issue. So far, again, the numbers all check out. I was careful to make sure that when I added the parts, tweak scale is required for KSB Interstellar, by the way. KSB Interstellar relies on tweak scale heavily, so it's not optional as long as we've got KSB Interstellar around. And we need KSB Interstellar around for the ion engine stuff. So that we can do ion engine burns while doing full time warp. Hmm. Crossfeed was disabled. I didn't actually check this engine to make sure it was okay. I hope it had the right ISP. We seem to have the same Delta V that like we had last time. Okay, ignition. ignition. Oh, it's using the low ISP. Shoot. we could have had much better performance. I really gotta pay attention to that. Why is... No, that's just lighting? That's weird. Yeah, that's weird. It extended the nozzle, but the engine mode was still in the unextended mode. It's supposed to do that at the same time. This is uh, Action Group 7, so it's supposed to be all at the same time. Okay, I thought you might still enjoy the approach to the moon. Oddly enough, my scroll wheel isn't working right now. I don't know why. Can't zoom in or out on the map view either. I've switched back and forth, forth so I'll probably have to go out and come back to the mission in order to fix that. But first, let's make orbit. We need to make sure the periapsis doesn't go too low yet. That'll have to do. Okay. Well, now let me make sure all the satellites are good and get my scroll wheel working again. 
and we'll try and make a landing. Okay, so I've time warped until the landing location is in daylight, but I'm having a few problems. I restarted the game and initially when I was in map view I could scroll and zoom in and out or zoom in and out here, but right now I can't zoom in and out. I've noticed that there is this argument exception an element with the same key already exists in the dictionary. That's interesting. So whatever exception that is could be causing a problem. Um, I looked at the tweak scale thread and there there's a whole bunch of stuff going on there. So I, I don't know what to how to sort that out. Right now this doesn't look feasible as far as just changing our inclination and trying to hit that. So I might have to wait a little bit longer. Um, be easier to hit it over here, I think. Yeah. So I'll probably have to wait a while. Fortunately, I haven't gotten any warnings about the power. Lunsat 1 is, of course, already gone. I lifted our orb. Oh, wait, I need to lift it again because uh, if it's under 100 kilometers, we can't time warp as much. So, yeah, there's all sorts of fun. The zoom thing is annoying, but it won't prevent me from being able to try this out. Well, we're getting closer, but I've noticed uh, an, an interesting phenomenon here as I time warp. See, that's the landed thing. You'll notice it's sort of orbiting its land landing point when I time warp. I'm not too sure that's how that's supposed to work. Okay, so can I uh, tilt enough now with this stage 337 to sort of hit that spot? I guess we'll go with this. I'm impatient and I've waited long enough. Waited a whole month. I didn't really want to raise the apple apses that much, but it's most important to get this thing to the right place and we'll do that part when we do the retro burn okay off so once we land we'll have to probably wait for a while before actually doing the drilling because there's not gonna be enough power fortunately I think we ended up with a little bit more Delta V left over because we shrunk this thing even though we added the radiators well we're basically coming straight down on it <laughs> Or hopefully, if we can slow down soon enough. I don't really need to get too close to it. It's just important that we're in the same general region for consistency's sake, as far as testing numbers is concerned. Okay, well, 300 meters is adequate. Let me just go with the suicide burn countdown now. I doubt we'll actually get that 300 meters, but I'm worried about my Delta V because it is such a horrible approach. Whoa, uh, SAS isn't doing a very SAS-y job right now. It's actually sort of... maybe, maybe it's... Be I don't know. Whoop. Maybe there's some imbalance or something, maybe? Because I added more stuff. Okay, RCS off, solar panels out, though I don't think they'll catch anything. We should check the drill maybe. I don't think it consumed that much electricity. At least we can see what the efficiency in all is. So, uh, I'll keep these off and just activate the stock ones. And what does it say? Um, thermal efficiency is 100%. Hydrates 5% load. Okay. I wouldn't say it's flooding. The hydrates are flooding in or anything, but all right. So that's one unit at 241, 242 ish. Basically, a unit every half an hour. Okay, I'm going to disable it because. Well, we're gonna lose power anyway. 
So I'm gonna time warp until uh, these things are in daylight. The other one's just 500 meters away there. And then we'll see what we can do as far as the whole conversion thing. Whether this small version is good for the electrolysis. Yeah, so I'll be right back. Okay, so I've time warped so that the location, the ISRU test location is in daylight. And a few things to know. First of all, I can zoom in and out with the scroll wheel here. And also the log does not show that error that I was having before. So whatever it is, it's only in flight view. That's important. And also I haven't been getting any of the power things. I haven't turned off the notification and they seem to be still powered because otherwise they wouldn't have communi uh, communication. But apparently the power stuff is working now. I don't know. So, but at least there hasn't been any, you know, th problems, uh, any notifications. So that's a relief. I didn't change anything, so I don't know what's happened. But basically during this episode, I haven't re had to reorient them for power at all. Okay, so let's do this again. Start hydrate drill. We'll note the time, uh, 1809. And we'll directly convert hydrates to water. And it seems like there's a small draw on our electric charge having those two. Well, no, no, no it's replenishing. Uh, when the sun's overhead, they'll be better. But right now, the panels are not at full efficiency. OK, so that's doable together. I don't want to start the fuel cell. I want to actually see how much gets produced. Um, we can't liquefy the hydrogen and oxygen until we get some, and we need this thing. And this will still probably take a lot of power. Just won't take. Oh, yeah. It's not as much power as before, but it's still 300 kilowatts. Um, let's see when it wipes out the liquid water. OK. It's wiped out the liquid water. All right. But the liquid water is being produced at a good pace. And so 610, basically we're at zero liquid water. Time warp. When I said 610, I mean 1810. We'll go for a day. Loons now we've got batteries the loon scan one will be fine. I'm still not using these radiators. But it seemed like we were at 100% efficiency even without them. Okay. So basically 5 units of liquid water a day is what we're looking at. And when we convert that to hydrogen and oxygen Loon sat too. I sort of want to fix. That's uh. Anyway, I think we've converted the original units of liquid water while actually doing the conversion. We've accumulated more. Okay, so I'll leave that off and let's see how much that is after we liquefy. It's not a whole lot. <laughs> is the short answer to that question. But we're just talking about a day. Hmm. I'll have to work out the numbers, so I'll have to decide. But sure s seems like... Well, we'll keep the hydrate processing on. That can go on indefinitely. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if there was any need for these radiators. And presumably they do just as good a job while being lighter because they're advanced technology. So this is what we see, 100% thermal efficiency and 5% load. Now a fancier drill might be able to get more, and this is the MEU-100. There might be an advanced model, but um, yeah, there are conversion limits given our electric charge. We can pack bigger batteries. That's not a problem. This is a very small battery for realism overhaul. Okay. I'm just going to quickly manage the satellites to make sure they're good with electric charge. And then we're going to launch another module to our Mars mission in orbit around the, uh, around Earth. 
Okay, so the next thing we're going to launch is the inflatable module, the BA-330 from Bigelow Aerospace. And we're going to attach it to the station. We're going to use the tug to take it off of this stage and place it on the station. But I wanted to show you th the provisions that we have. So I've temporarily put some Kerbals in. And so this is going to carry 180 days of food, water, and oxygen. Uh, wait, oxygen? Uh, straight up. Um, now, technically we probably shouldn't need the 180 days of water because we're going to be putting a recycler on it. Uh, so, but uh, I guess for this first test, better safe than sorry, we might want to lighten that load up. Water is heavy. Water is heavy. Um, we're carrying the full three years of nitrogen for a nominal maximum mission. Uh, it's two, uh, two years and 270 days. Um, but uh, that's something to remember. We have to carry enough nitrogen in each module to pressurize it fully. So it's not that we can, unlike the food, water, and oxygen, we can't distribute it among different modules. This nitrogen is just for this module and then the nitrogen for the other ones for those because the leak, the amount of consumption is based on the size of the module. I wanted to check that it's not misunderstanding the size of this when I inflate. So let's see if that changes anything. No, it does not seem to. And there's a separate habitat and collider. Now it says comfort poor and somebody noted that they like they like windows and so the comfort factor is uh, I mean I, maybe I should put a little exercise module in here hmm I don't know um, technically as a window it has one right there I don't know we'll see um, we'll have to see what the duration is with the other modules attached as well um, I've only got half shielding on here because frankly it's really heavy if you put the full shielding so I'll, I'll take out the Kerbals right now before I forget and let's see what the mass of this is it's 26.59 tons is this right now so yeah it's pretty heavy and then if we up the shielding completely you can see it went from 26.59 to 28.25 so 1.7 ish tons so yeah that's a lot and you know we've sort of tested half shielding and seen that it could work out and then the other modules that we've already added are with full shielding so anyway we'll see how this is pressurization is good EVA is available 2793 I don't know how that's calculated actually um, so yeah stress this says comfort none Hmm. I don't know how to figure out the call home thing. I don't know what that is. I feel like I've not put enough modules in here. They should at least have an exercise machine in here. Scrubber, humidity control. So this one is from Raider Nick's miscellaneous pack. Um, there are other options like the USI inflatables or the SSTU inflatables, but they all require other resources to inflate and I don't want to take an extra mission. Now somebody had asked about nuclear engines in the comments I just saw and other people have, men uh, people have mentioned why use ion instead of nuclear. Well, uh, there are lots of reasons. First of all, I'm mainly trying to confine myself to off-the-shelf stuff, stuff that seems to be ready to go and that's a first consideration uh, but second consideration is people don't often understand how nuclear works so let me bring out a stage to demonstrate okay so here is a stage with the duration of an S4B and a J2 at the bottom of it so there's a standard J2 stage and uh, hydrogen and oxygen of course I've said to cryogenic it's got a six percent utilization and it's carrying a B330 or BA330 module at the top and has 6,476 meters per second. If I take this off and put instead a nuclear engine, let's go with this Nerva XE1000. It has 239 kilonewtons, which is a quarter of the J2, but it has that juicy 898 vacuum ISP. It looks small, which is sort of weird. I think this thing is not scaled properly. Something is wrong with this model. 
Anyway, it's 10 tons dry. And we need to remove all the tanks and just put the liquid hydrogen. One thing you'll notice is that it has less delta V, right? Now, it has less mass too, right? Uh, it only has 66 tons because hydrogen is not very dense. So, all right, let's see what the mass of the J2 stage is. This is, a, I, I don't know if I trust this thing or not. Uh, there's a lot of rocket motors here. None of them are gonna make too much of a difference. I trust that this thing's stats are correct though, for what it is. So there's some form of Nerva. And uh, 4,683 at 66 tons, right? Okay, so let's put this on. Put Hydrolox again. And let's uh, reduce its size to 66 tons, right? And that includes the payload. 66 tons. So with the nuclear engine, you got 4,683. With the J2, you get 4,061. So the, the, the issue here is um, the tank size and the dry mass of the nuclear engine. Now the nuclear engine is only giving you a quarter of the thrust that the J2 has. And yet, so you could fit a lighter engine, right? The J2 is a slightly heavier engine. If you matched thrust with the Nerva, you would use a lighter engine and get more delta V out of it. But uh, yeah, so this is why nuclear engines are often not worth it. If they're so expensive, do you really want the extra 15% of delta V? And then you have to manufacture a huge tank to carry the liquid hydrogen, which is not very dense. And then you have to have some way of storing the liquid hydrogen without boil off, which costs more and probably adds more to the tank right you have to dump those MLI layers on and all that business they're not that bad though uh, so yeah this is why nuclear engines not often useful I have to say um, you have to also con take into consideration the RCS situation which means that probably with the nuclear engine you're going to be using hydrogen gas thrusters in which case uh, you are going with 260 seconds ISP max so that will reduce the overall efficiency of the stage because, you know, eventually you're going to have to turn it at some point. Um, the RCS on a J2 stage normally was hypergolics that are a little bit better on the ISP than 260. Uh, 260 is the absolute max for just hydrogen gas, I think. Uh, on the op uh, alternatively, you could use Hydrolox RCS at about 400 seconds ISP, though that's somewhat futuristic technology. Uh, so yeah, this is basically the the sum of it. Uh, you've got the big heavy tank that needs to carry the the hydrogen, and of course, if you actually tried to want to match the six thousand or so that this could give with that payload, you'd have to make a much larger tank, which my rockets now can't really carry. So it'd have to be about that size. So starting to get about that size. You know, if you really need this delta V, uh, this begins to be a viable option, of course. It's only when it's uh, the 66 tons or less, you know, that uh, the J2 doesn't seem too bad, or a Hydrolox engine doesn't seem too bad. You have to have a fairly large thing in order to justify using the, the, uh, the Nerva stage. All right. So this is what goes into it, and the ion engines are just nice. <laughs> they're, they're, they're available. Uh, the size of ion engines that I'm using are things that have been tested. The solar panels that we're going to be using with the ion engines are the ones from the ISS. So those have been tested, so I don't have any worries about that business. Whereas the nuclear engines are all, I mean, th they have been tested, but they're not really off the shelf at this point. So yeah. Anyway, let's get on with our launch. I should note that with the B330 that I prepared with the launch, I didn't put the radiators and solar panels because we're going to be putting those on separate modules. All right, so here we go. Okay, well, it looks like after all that time around the moon, we're finally at a point where we can launch in daylight around here. Okay, and I put antennae on this stage now so it can deorbit. Um, had to because there's apparently no antenna inside the inflatable hab. 
So something had to have an antenna. So G uh, heavy. And here we go again. I actually had to increase the size of the launch platform just for this tweak scale. And that's the largest fairing size available for this rocket series. It was made especially for the B-330. I want to see why... why uh, previously that thing... Oh god, it just sort of glitches out and I don't know what just happened. In 1.3.1 uh, 1 it never did that, but boy, and this time it seems much more vigorous. I thought we saw it previously just explode on the pad, but wow. Daylight helps when it comes to diagnosing problems, but hmm, I don't know what to make of that one. Yeah, that definitely got further downranged in the previous explosions. Okay, and staging. So in short, if I was using a system like Saturn 1 or uh, New Glenn or Saturn 5, something that wide, I think nuclear engines would be a little bit more interesting to me. But right now I'm trying to make it as tight as possible. Nice, discreet little packages. There's a crew tube here. I want it as an extension for the stocking port because otherwise the tug can't really grasp this because this diameter is too wide for the tug that we already have up there. So yeah. This has a limited amount of time in order to make a rendezvous. Because we don't have any solar panels on here right now. These are the antennae. So we're talking about 210,000 units and that's it. Let's see if this starts properly. Well, it doesn't extend the nozzle. <laughs> but it's got the right ISP. Crossfeed is on there. Alright. Okay, obviously we've got quite a surplus of Delta V. A smaller rock. The problem is, there's not really something between the Sagita and Sagita Heavy except for a Sagita with a bunch of little boosters. And those have been colliding with each other on separation recently. So I was a little bit shy about using them again. But I don't know how many. We probably need more than four boosters to lift this with a Sagita. So I don't know if it'd be doable. Anyway, um, we are in a lower orbit, but. Well, it's diametrically opposite. I mean, it's sort of better for it to catch up. Well, see, we have a limited amount of time. Um, we have a lot of delta V, but not a whole lot of electric charge. So, um, no, let's let's work on that inclination right now. We can afford five hundred and bring it down with five hundred. Okay. Oh, I thought I had put more nitrogen in here. Oh, shoot. That's not the amount of nitrogen I wanted in here. Oh, gosh darn it. It must have reverted to an earlier save. I must have not have saved it properly. Oh, great. I was supposed to have like 100,000, not 3,300. Well, I better start selling that fuel down. It takes a while. Even though the burn itself won't take very long. Come on, come on. Oh, it might already be too late. Come on, sell it down. Alright. No SAS. Close approach distance 371.9 meters, huh? Well, that was better than I thought it would be. Okay, um, actually go negative relative velocity in preparation for slowing down again. 
We've used four burns with this so far. Okay, coming alongside. Okay, well, kill rotation will be fine. Over to the other side. Okay. Uh, seems to have enough power for now. Should still be controlling from here. Now, there's that thing. Okay, we have connection. We are going to separate from the stage. The stage can now deorbit. Oh. Can't. Oh. It still doesn't have. But. I, I swear it should have a probe core. It's got the capacity and everything. It's got the commutatrons. I don't understand what's going on with this part. Okay. Well, anyway, we've got business to attend to. It seems like we were getting power just because uh, we, uh, the sun was close to coming up. It's clearly about to rise. Okay, so now... Yes, that is our target. Okay, that's better. That should do the trick. Obviously, the RCS on both sides is imbalanced, so this is going to be a delicate sort of procedure. Okay, closing slowly and carefully. All right, we have docked. Well, let's do the inflatable thing. I mean, it's not huge. It's a heck of a lot bigger than these two, though. I mean, it's a significant increase in space. So let's see what Kerbalism has to say about all this. I guess that's the name now. Info. Well, there's too much perpetual because of the... Because there's no Kerbal on board. Um, the nitrogen is a problem. We didn't bring up the correct load of nitrogen with this. So we'll have to fix that. I, again, I should have packed some lithium hydroxide with this as well, but that's not necessary. That doesn't deplete with the particular module. We'll send that up separately, and I guess we'll have to send up some bonus nitrogen as well. And things are repowering. That's not bad as far as the orientation is concerned. All right, so this is what it looks like right now. Next up uh, for you know, going along this way is the main solar trusses. And we should have radiators on there as well. And yeah, that will be next in the construction queue. So with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.